so I'll, I'll get started. Welcome, and thank you for uh, attending uh, late in the day here on the third day of IDUG. I appreciate you uh, showing up. And what I'm going to talk about is challenges of DB2 in the digital age, otherwise known as it's not your daddy's DB2. Things are changing, and uh, we'll talk about uh, a lot of those things along the way. Before I uh, move on and into the guts of the presentation, I'm sure most of you know me. For those of you who don't, I've been around DB2 since version 1, so I'm older than I look. <laughs> and uh, written a couple books, uh, one on DB2, the DB2 Developer's Guide, another one on DBA uh, practices. I'm an independent consultant focusing most on DB2, but also on other data management type issues. So, the agenda, what am I going to be talking about today? Uh, basically, really in two parts. I want to talk a bit about industry and DBA trends. Uh, basically, what's happening with uh, IT and data that all of us, regardless of the DBMS that we use, are really facing and having to struggle with. And uh, also, some of the trends that are impacting uh, DBAs. Uh, how are organizations uh, staffing DBAs and expecting DBAs to work with this uh, changing landscape? The second part of the presentation, we'll be talking about uh, DB2 modernization, for lack of a better term. Uh, and this is where I'll kind of dig into uh, some of the things that uh, are really changing with DB2 over the course of the past few releases in terms of uh, database design, in terms of security, and development trends. And then we'll finish it up with some guidance on how you can uh, work in that environment. So kind of the premise I think is, you know, that it's not your daddy's DB2, and if you are managing, dealing with DB2 the same way you did 10, 15 years ago, you're doing it wrong. And it's time to start changing and looking at uh, what's changing out there and how that impacts your organization. So with that said, uh, I'm going to talk about industry and DBA trends. And I apologize for these slides not uh, turning over here. Let me see if I can. Pardon. Okay. All right. Just talk. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's not. It is in presenter mode. Uh, let's, uh, let's try. Well, maybe. I do. Let's see. Oh, okay. Here we go. <laughs> when in doubt, pull the plug and plug it back in, right? And what did we do to fix that? We don't know. <laughs> Yeah. So, what's the biggest uh, trend out there that's impacting all of us? And obviously, that trend has got to be the amount of data that uh, we're managing. It's just exploding. The amount of data we're expected to manage. Um, uh, for the past probably 10 years, I've been uh, standing up here and saying, I visit a lot of shops over the course of uh, my consulting career, and never once if I had a DBA come up to me and say, you know, Craig, my databases are getting smaller. What should I do? They're getting bigger, right? And this, uh, I, I, all these uh, things I'm going to put up here are sourced. So this is from an IDC study sponsored by EMC talking about during this decade that the growth is going to be 50-fold in data or what they call the digital universe. Some supporting quotes here uh, from uh, Google, five exabytes of information created between the dawn of civilization in 2003, but now we do that every two days. Or uh, this one uh, from uh, managing the rapid rise in database growth, more than one third of companies uh, report that data stores are growing at a great rate greater than 20% a year. So more and more data 
uh, being added to the mix. I mean, you look at you know some of the things we have here where we're talking about the number of exabytes. Some of us are exabyte challenged. I like to put up this uh, slide showing the difference between you know gigabyte, terabytes, where we're probably all comfortable through petabytes, through exabytes, and the most recent one that I've seen is the Bronto byte. And uh, I think I think whoever was watching, whoever created that, was watching too much Flintstones, right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, it, the the we're inventing terms because the amount of data that we're storing is much greater than we've ever had to deal with in the past. And some of this is encompassed in this term big data. And you know, I'm not going to turn this into a big data uh, presentation. You've probably seen that several times during the course of the week here. But there are a few things that I think are worth mentioning. And it's this shift that's happening in terms of how IT deals with things and manages things. And big data is an aspect of that shift, where instead of managing mostly internal data, we've shifted to handle, man handle data not just internally, but from multiple sources. So we're sucking in data from other places, as well as the data we create ourselves. And we're shifting from transactional to add analytical. The other thing, when I say shift, read that as add to, not move away from. That's one of the big mistakes that I think a lot of the people who promote no SQL and promote big data. They're talking about it's taken over the world. Everything you know is no longer valid. That's a big fat lie because everything you know isn't going anywhere. It's staying here. You're not going to have your bank run on no SQL databases without acid, right? If you do, you need a new bank. Anyway, so these shifts are from keeping what we have, adding to this additional stuff. So we're shifting from structured to add unstructured data. And you know, while I'm at it, that's one of the worst terms we've ever created, unstructured data. There's no such thing as unstructured data. If it's unstructured, it's unusable. No structure to it. You have no idea what's in there. You're never going to use it. It's differently structured. So when I say unstructured data, what you probably are thinking and what you should be thinking is it's not the traditional numbers, characters, dates, and times. That's structured. Everything else is unstructured. But it has a structure to it. If you doubt that, you know, people talk about unstructured data being an Excel spreadsheet or a Word document. Try to bring up that Word document outside of Word and see the mess that's there. That mess, that's the structure that Word understands to read it. It's structured differently. Anyway, uh, and then the shift from persistent data to constantly on the move data. Sometimes we care about data that never gets stored, streaming data, looking for patterns in the stream. And this is, this persistence term came about with object orientation. And when it came about, it was the most useless term on the planet, I thought. Because, you know, as a DBA, it's like if it's not persistent, why do I even care about it? So why are we even talking about persistence? But now it's becoming interesting because of the vast amount of data and social media data that, you know, we don't want to store everything that comes across the screen on a Twitter feed, but we may be looking for social media sentiment for our marketing data that matters. So we're looking for things that stream across that we're not going to totally persist. So all these things are changing the way in which we deal with data. And at that point, you start to say, all right, so what is big data? And big data, uh, a lot of times people start talking about the Vs, you know, the, the velocity and the variety and the volume. And yeah, that's fine and that's great for an analyst description of it. But to me, big data is the sort of at the crux of a confluence of trends, all of these trends. 
And what we see with you know, business intelligence with structured query, as well as adding analytical tools to the mix, cloud computing, allowing us to store not data, not just here, but also out in the cloud, distributed data, new types of ways of storing data, sensors generating data all the time, mobile and network devices. There are more network devices than there are people on the planet, and there has been since 2011. That's going to get even greater with the Internet of Things, where all these things are going to be connected together, generating information. And even the traditional relational database management system contributes to this whole big data uh, architecture environment meme, if you will. So big data is not just a one thing. It's multiple things conspiring together to allow us to do much more than we ever could in the past. And that creates this. And you know, I gave this uh, a, a version of this presentation a couple weeks ago in New York, and immediately people thought I put up a map of the subway. <laughs> it kind of looks like that, right? <laughs> but this is a uh, graphic that a group called 451 Research, an analyst group, uh, puts out regularly. And the last time they did it was about a year ago, so they're probably due to put out a new one. And this is a view into all of the different database management systems that uh, are out on the market and being used today. Now, go back 10 years ago. Go back 15 years ago. What did all the analyst groups talk about? The big three, Oracle, Microsoft, IBM, they're here. We've got IBM, we've got Oracle, we've got Microsoft. So it's this small portion that's the big three. So I think we've gone from the big three to the big mess. And really, what you have here is the relational zone, the non-relational zone, uh, a grid cache zone, and all these different competing technologies that uh, are a component of this big data explosion. So instead of putting everything into the relational uh, stuff, we start putting it into NoSQL stores. We put it into uh, a graph database. A, uh, we put it into a key value database. And lots of mainframers in the room. You know the first key value database? We called it vSAM, right? I mean, these things aren't new. They're not new ideas. Uh, but they are, in some cases, useful ideas for certain types of applications. So we see people, and again, the shift is keep what we have, add to it. And the term polyglot persistence, meaning the right database used to store the right data for the right application. Good idea rarely gotten correctly. In order to do that, you have to know what the use cases are for each one of those database systems. And I can almost guarantee I could go to uh, someone who's out there spouting about NoSQL, and they wouldn't be able to tell me when I would use key value versus when I would use document versus when I would use relational. And when I would use relational would never come off the lips of some of those people. I'm here to tell you, relational still matters, and not just for transactional. I've got a lot of these slides coming up. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. But these are all from uh, surveys and uh, studies conducted by different groups over the course of the past couple years. And this uh, one was asking, what type of data does your organization collect as part of its big data program? Number one, structured transaction data. Where do you think that comes from? Not from a NoSQL database. It's coming from DB2. It might even be coming from IMS. It's coming from the things that run your organization. What about what technologies does your organization use? Again, the BI and data warehousing uh, survey done by Search Business Analytics. Mainstream relational databases, data warehouses. Sure, we're using Hadoop, and we're using some of these analytical databases, NoSQL. It's on there. But number one, still relational. Another study, this one done by uh, Unisphere. They're the people that publish database trends and applications. Same thing. Big data technologies adopted. 
relational databases. What about the technologies used by data scientists? Right, Data scientists are the people figuring out what type of analytics we're running on our data. Number one, SQL. Sure, we've got R and Python and some of these other uh, modern statistical languages, and they're, they're being adopted. But number one is still SQL. So what you know, your relational stuff, isn't obsolete and isn't going to be obsolete in the big data analytics world either. We're going to continue to use it in the transaction world, and it's still a component of what we're doing in the big data realm. So with all that in mind, some of these industry type of trends, let's take a, a shift and look at DBA trends. So we've got all this data and all of these new technologies and you know the, the subway map of database systems that you know we may be called on to support. What's going on with organizations in terms of how they're reacting to this? We're not adding DBAs, or if we are, we're adding them very slowly. So you've got this compound annual growth rate of 50-fold growth over the course of the decade, and you know how many DBAs are we adding? Not 50-fold. So fewer DBAs are being asked to manage more data. So there's more and more data, not more and more people who know what to do with that data. Frequently, the DBA is being asked to manage multiple DBMSs, right? The day in which you could become the DB2 for ZOS guru in the corner and everybody was scared of going back to you and asking a question, those days are gone. Because now you have to know DB2 for ZOS and maybe LUW and Oracle. And oh, by the way, we just rolled in this React server. What can you do about that? And oh, the Hadoop project needs your help. Well, how can you be an expert on all of that? The answer is you can't. But your organization expects you to be. These are some studies, again, from Unisphere. Uh, how many database instances does each DBA manage? 1.14% said one. I think it'd be interesting to do some data mining there, find out what that company is, and that'd be the place to be the DBA. <laughs> but uh, you know, we got anything from uh, 2 to 10, more than 500. Uh, these poor people don't know. <laughs> Uh, I guess when it gets greater than 500, there's no way of knowing for sure, right? <laughs> uh, the number of databases for, each, for which each DBA is responsible, is it increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? The vast majority increasing, some staying the same, and again, decreasing. This might be the same people that are up here. Uh, how many database platforms from different vendors is each DBA responsible for? This is a little bit more encouraging where we've got a nice chunk, about a third, only responsible for one, but the vast majority, you know, around 70%, it's multiple, two, three to five, more than five. Add to that, are you responsible for relational as well as non-relational? Again, almost 70% of the pie said yes. So now you have to be an expert in relational, and not just relational, but maybe multiple relational products. And now you add to that NoSQL and Hadoop and Spark. And then you think, well, all right, that's three. But no, it's not three. NoSQL is four. There's four different types of NoSQL database, the wide column store, the document store, the key value store, and the graph database. And there's multiple players in each one of them that does it differently. So I guess the thought here is, do you really want to be a DBA? <laughs> it's challenging work, though, so that's good. So what are the challenges that the DBA has to really embrace in order to succeed in this changing world. Well, uh, you've got to start learning new technologies. You've got to start understanding what is Hadoop. How does Hadoop play into my architecture? What is NoSQL? How do each of these NoSQL DBMSs work? When should I be getting my nose into this to try to stop some of this NoSQL from coming in where it doesn't belong? And where should I promote it coming in where it does belong? 
in order to make those types of decisions, you got to understand what the stuff is. And a lot of times, uh, you know, one of the other trends I don't have listed on the slide is organizations are not spending a lot of money on training, right? So they say, uh, we brought in MongoDB, this nice NoSQL document, DBMS. You're the DBA, figure it out. Can I have some training? No, go online, just learn it. Learn it on the job, but don't make any mistakes. That's the life we lead as DBAs these days. Structured data, still the bedrock of what we manage, but unstructured data is growing. Remember my definition of unstructured data. It's raw data growth, part of the story, more data types being captured. Uh, if you look at something like IDC, it says unstructured data accounts for 90% of all digital information. I don't know if that's right, but it, it sounds like it could be. Uh, uh, most important driver is not what you hear. But you remember when LOBS got introduced and, and everyone was talking about, now I can store check images. Or now in my employee database, I can have a picture of my employee. Sure, that's unstructured data, but that's boring unstructured data. It's the easy stuff that you do first. What's driving this is documents, large text documents, email, social media text, logs, these types of information trying to be sucked into our database. That's the challenging part of unstructured data. The other thing that's interesting is for DBAs, uh, maintenance and performance are still the top responsibility areas for DBAs, but security is growing increasingly important. The, the problem that you run into here then becomes who is responsible for all the security. And in a mainframe world, it could be multiple organizations when it comes to DB2. You know, you go back 20 years and you had the security group and they did all security for the mainframe. Well, that, probably 30 years now, I guess you go back for that. And then DB2 rolls in with its own security and the DBAs start doing that. And really today, the best practice is to let the security people handle that type of stuff. You know, put it in ACF2, put it in RACF. Uh, it's not something that you really want your DBAs doing. But there's a lot of other complicated things that come in with in terms of encryption, in terms of uh, how, how you're going to uh, implement uh, trusted context and things of that nature that your DBAs are going to have to understand and work with your security people to implement because that's not something that a typical RACF groups can understand how to do. So you can't just throw it over the wall and let other people handle it. Into the structured versus unstructured data realm, this is again from the Unisphere study. Uh, how fast is the amount of structured data growing annually at your organization? And the sweet spot here is between 10 and 50 percent. Uh, almost 80 percent of the respondents are saying the, it's growing really rather rapidly, almost doubling to 10%. The interesting one, I think, is uh, here for the unstructured data. Uh, you got a lot of stuff grouped up here uh, between less than 10 and 50, but you got this big long tail at the end. Yeah, I, I don't know. Again, there's just a lot of folks who don't understand the amount of data growth that their organization is grappling with. And the interesting thing, too, is this was a study of DBAs. Now, maybe the DBAs haven't yet ingested the unstructured data into their database systems. Maybe they're only talking about lobs and how they're dealing with lobs or blobs in their database systems. But clearly, there's an issue that needs to be embraced and tackled. Add to all of this, this is the BMC annual mainframe survey that they do. Uh, you add all these up, what's the downtime that you can uh, tolerate? 39% uh, can't tolerate an outage of greater than a minute. So less than five seconds up to about 59 seconds is uh, close to 40% of the environment. So more data, fewer DBAs, lots more things to do lots of, I'm sorry, no tolerance for downtime. Which brings into account the question of autonomics, right? Autonomics where 
things can manage themselves, the lights out data center. And we've been talking about this for years too, and it still isn't there. There's more and more of it coming where you have software that is intelligent. So the intelligence adds on top of the automation and allows it to then become somewhat self-managing. You see that being built into utilities. You see that being built into ISV software. You see more and more of this. But as DBAs, our general response is, yeah, that sounds good, but let me run this showing me what it says it would do before it does it. I want to trust that it really knows what it's doing. And the first time it makes a mistake, it loses all of my trust. Right? And these things have to become much better. What we need, what we really need, is Watson the DBA. Right? Where Watson is this artificial intelligence who understands how to answer questions on Jeopardy. That's fine. Tell me when I need to reorganize my database. Tell me when I can reorganize my database. Tell me how that actually happens and the right way to do that. Now that's an interesting thing. And Autonomics are going to allow us to have systems capable of self-management, overcoming this complexity that we're talking about, and reducing this barrier to further growth that complexity causes. Characteristics, what do autonomic systems provide? Uh, basically, they are automatic, adaptive, aware, and self-managing. All of these things together make an autonomic system. At this point, usually someone's thinking, well, uh, is my job going to be automated out of existence? No. Never. I mean, if you think about autonomics and automation, what we as IT people have been doing for years is automating everybody else's job. Now, when it comes to automating our job, we start thinking, well, you can't do that. But, yeah, yes, yes, you can. You can automate your job. Not all of it but good portions of it, so that instead of doing the by rote things that could be automated, could become autonomic policies, you then start concentrating on the other things that can't. Understanding how to adopt and support all these multiple different DBMSs, the different types, the use cases for when they make sense. The other thing is, you know, I, I, whenever someone tells me autonomics are going to replace DBAs, I always say, okay, what about recovery? If the system was that damn smart to begin with, why does it need to be recovered? Right? So I never think that autonomic recovery is something that I'm really going to start supporting. Automated, where I can simplify the job of recovery, but if it was so smart, it wouldn't have a failure that I would need to be recovering from. So autonomics won't replace your job. It's going to change your job. Okay, so that's industry trends, DBA trends. Hopefully you're all sufficiently scared. <laughs> Let's now look at one specific area, DB2 for ZOS, and how DB2 for ZOS has been changing over the course of the past few releases. The it's not your daddy's DB2 part. The whole thrust of this is basically what we have been dealing with where DB2 is being asked to do more. And with larger amounts and more types of data that are being accessed more rapidly and from more sources without any prolonged downtime being permitted, as well as with fewer DBAs, DBAs devoted specifically to DB2 than we've ever had in the past. That's the challenge. I don't see anyone smiling. <laughs> yeah. So. Let's talk about DB2. It, it, again, if your DB2 looks like it did in 1999, things are wrong. Things are problematic. As I uh, visit organizations in my uh, job as a consultant, one of the things I kind of look at is you know, when are people using DB2 at the extremes? And more and more people are doing that. What we're seeing now is uh, DDF transaction rates uh, extremely higher, much higher than they used to be. And these numbers are not for brief bursts. So many organizations may have a brief burst in these 
uh, in this realm. But they're for sustained transactions over at least an hour's worth of time. Uh, a thousand or more per second for a multi-member data sharing group, 750 or more per second for a single DB2 subsystem. If you're doing that, you're out there on the edges. You're, you're, you're at the extreme. Uh, the amount of workload that is DDF, it's increasing in most shops. At the extreme, as much as 95% of the workload. All modern development, well, let me rephrase that. Almost all modern development is distributed, is dynamic. Buffer pool size, extreme these days, 100 gigabyte plus. But this is becoming more common. And as we go to new versions that support bigger buffer pools, also new versions of ZOS are required to support some of these things that uh, IBM is bringing in the next version. We're going to see this go up quite a bit, too. Members in a data sharing group, more than 20. You're out there on the extremes. There was a company in Germany that I was talking to probably about nine months ago now that had, I think, 22 in a data sharing group. So we're pushing the limits of DB2. At least some of us are. The other thing is understanding uh, the history of DB2 and where we are. Uh, 1983 was when DB2 uh, was announced. Uh, so that's, uh, what, 33 years ago. It was uh, made available 31 years ago, April 2nd, 1985. I often wonder, was it ready on April 1st, but they didn't want to put it out on April 1st? <laughs> <laughs> Probably a good decision. <laughs> But anyway, if you take a look at the early days of DB2, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 91, really rapid releases, right? The other thing that you look here and see is point releases. You know, we had point releases for the first two versions of DB2. You know, we don't anymore. Now it's versions. Every, basically every three years, we get a new version these days. You know, 2013, 2010, 2007, 2004, 2001. So 2013 was the last uh, GA date. What year is it? 2016. I'm going to have to modify the chart soon because uh, version 12 is on its way. It hasn't been formally announced, but, it, but it's on its way. So now we have to prepare for DB2 every three years. And as we do this, migrating to a new version of DB2, in the old days, it used to be pretty easy, right? You'd say, well... I'm moving to a new version of DB2 because it has this or it has that feature and I want to add new functionality to DB2. These days, we're looking at moving to DB2 for possibly still that reason, possibly because IBM has cut off a past version and we want to make sure that we're still being supported. Possibly just for pure performance, and we don't care about any new features. So those are generally the three reasons that we're moving forward. But as you move forward, you get this new functionality. And if you are not understanding and taking advantage of the new functionality as it gets introduced into your organization, you are behind the times, and there are things that DB2 can do that you can't do because you haven't implemented the new features. We'll get into that. You'll see some examples of that as we move forward. We're going to talk about table spaces and specifically universal table spaces. We'll look at unstructured data and some of the ways in which handling it in LOBS complicates database administration. We'll look at some of the new SQL. We'll, uh, we'll talk about dynamic SQL. Uh, for those of you who were in my presentation earlier today, there's these things called incompatibilities now, and they're tracked with uh, incompatibility uh, ICIs and the if kids. So what it's saying is when you go to a new version of DB2, things that used to work one way now work a different way. And you have to be prepared to either accept the way that new way works, the built-in function doesn't return the decimal characters in this format. It's now in this format. You either accept that or you change your code. And the, the number of these is increasing from version to version. So this 
is not the same as this, deprecated features. Deprecated features are things that uh, were functions DB2 used to have, maybe sometimes had it for a long time, and is removing from the DBMS. So one of the things that's imminent is the deprecation of BRF, basic row format. You're going to have to go to uh, the uh, reordered row format when you get to uh, version 12. Another interesting one here, this, I have this one uh, crossed off on the slide because when I was putting this together, synonyms were on the deprecation list. And then as I was uh, finalizing things, the word kind of came down that, oh, well, we're not going to deprecate synonyms, at least for now. So that's kind of good news. But that doesn't mean that they aren't deprecating other things that you have to worry about every time you go to a new version of DB2. So yes, what's new? What are we going to adopt? But also, what's going away? And what doesn't work the same way that it used to work? All those things we have to worry about when we go to new releases. Now let's start looking at some of these things in a little more depth. First of all, uh, table spaces and the types of table spaces. Simple, long gone. So basically, we have segmented, partitioned, universal, lob, and XML table spaces. Let's not talk about lob or XML right now. We've got segmented, partitioned, universal. These partition, classic partition table spaces we're talking about. Segmented table spaces, still viable for use right now. The reason being, that's the only table space remaining that can have multiple tables stored in it. Okay. Partitioned, they're still supported. They're not deprecated. Uh, you can have index-controlled partitioning. You can have uh, table-controlled partitioning. Table-controlled is the way to go. So you should be moving from uh, index-controlled to table-controlled, at least in this instance. And what you really should be doing is moving from partitioned to universal. And there's the benefits of universal being that they combine par the benefits of partitioned and the benefits of segmented. So a universal table space, you can think of as a segmented partitioned table space. Now there's two types, uh, partition by growth, partition by range. Partition by growth, you don't have any type of indicator as to where the data goes. It keeps going into the same partition till it gets to the maximum size, creates a new partition. Partition by range are basically the new version of the classic partitioned. Um, neither one of them at this point, partition by growth or partition by range, can have more than one table per table space. My prediction, eventually, partition by growth will be able to have more than one table per table space. But again, that's just my prediction. I'm not IBM. Don't believe me till you see it. Okay. The future and the present is universal table spaces. Whenever you create a new table space, it should be universal, partition by growth or partition by range, unless it's a table space that you have to have multiple tables in. Okay. Other than that, there's no reason to create a, a segmented or a classic partition table space anymore. The, we'll get into uh, altering them in a minute. So why am I saying that? You still have the ability to create them. They haven't been deprecated yet. First of all, you can have larger size with universal table spaces. And that's important for all the reasons we just talked about with big data and more data and all this data coming down the pipe. However, newer features, many of them only work with universal table spaces. So if you're not converting to universal table spaces, your job as a DBA becomes that much more complicated because you have to figure out, all right, I know this feature exists. I'm going to create clone tables, for example. I have a clone. We'll talk about clones a little bit later in the presentation. But with a clone table, you can have a, a table and another table, and you repopulate the data, and you switch between the two of them. Yeah, great. Sounds great. I want to do that for this segmented table space. Can't do it. So as a DBA, you have to figure out this new functionality that comes along that only works for universal. And then understand you can't implement it if you don't have universal table spaces. Wouldn't it be much easier to convert to universal and realize all the new functionality coming down the pike from IBM is going to work with universal table spaces? 
that's another reason why I say eventually you're going to get multi-table universal table spaces because how much longer can they keep introducing new features for only this type of table space and not allow you to do it on segmented because segmented are the only ones that have multiple tables in them. So it, it, it's come. So what should we be doing? This comes out of the uh, uh, red book, uh, the technical overview for DB210. Should be looking to convert. We want to move from index controlled to table controlled classic partition. That's a one way move. That's an indication when it's a one way move that the idea is eventually where you're going from isn't going to be there forever. Um, here, simple, segmented, one way move to partition by growth. If you want to go to a hash table space, hashing came about uh, if how many people work with IMS in the past? Few of you, so you know what hashes are. Those of you who don't, uh, who didn't, a hash is basically a way of saying uh, take the key value and run it through an algorithm that gives me a location on disk where this row is going to be stored. So that when you go to read that by the key, it quickly goes through the algorithm, goes right to disk where it is, doesn't need any indexing, very rapid access. Great if you're doing key lookup. Not great if you're doing range lookup. Okay, But there's a possibility for having these hash table spaces, and uh, that's a two-way. So if you go to a hash and you don't want hash anymore, you can go backwards. <coughs> All right, so that's a quick look at table spaces, quick promotion of universal. Let's talk a little bit about unstructured data. Uh, unstructured data usage is growing. This requires lobs in the DB2 uh, table space, and uh, lobs uh, are very well supported these days, as opposed to when they first came out, it, it was kind of like, wow, these are slow, but at least they're hard to use. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, they're, they're very well supported. Uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of use cases, as I said, not just check images, but uh, multiple types of use cases for these. The other thing is, you can't just poke your head in the sand and say, I'm not using them. You're using more lobs whether you want them or not. Here's what's happening with the DB2 catalog. More and more lobs in the DB2 catalog. Hopefully you've noticed. You know, go back to version 5, there were none. Version 7, we got 2. Version 9, up to 6. As of version 11, there are 42 lobs in the DB2 catalog. So you've got them whether you're implementing them in your user table spaces or not. Now, there's reasons to store these things, right? You, know, you want to have large text, large audio, large video, images, and we're getting pressure from the business to store more and more of these things, so it's great. Putting them in the database uh, makes a lot of sense. As you use lob data, you need to start thinking about the different impact that's going to have on you as a DBA. Number one, the first obvious impact is size. Uh, you look at all these different types of uh, large object candidates from uh, you know, small images uh, from 30 to 50K up here to high def TV, 720 gigabytes an hour. Depending on what you're storing, you might be causing a huge amount of new data to be added to your uh, database. Well, I said huge like Donald Trump. I better stop doing that. <laughs> uh, Lob logging is another thing you need to keep in mind. Uh, do, you, do you want to log changes to a lob column? Probably not. I mean, lobs are large amounts of data. You make a small change to a lob. Uh, what would that amount of data being stored on your log do to your logging process, your recovery process? So logging these things, probably not a good idea, uh, meaning we're going to put in the DDL not logged in the lob table space. However, uh, keep in mind what that means. We're not logging it. It's not recoverable. You lose things. You've got to have a way of getting this data back. Sometimes it's you know, not that big of a deal. If we're storing uh, an image, the chance that we're going to go out and modify the image in the database is, is slim. Uh, but maybe sometimes with a document, uh, you might be doing that type of modification and care about it and have to worry about uh, recovering it outside the scope of the database. 
There's restrictions on lob columns. Pulled this right out of the manual, not going to read it, other than to, uh, as an overview, say you can't use lobs everywhere you can use other columns in your SQL statements. So you have to understand the restrictions on uh, lob data once you start using it in, in your database. And it can make uh, uh, reading uh, data a little bit more complicated. Uh, so if you've changed queries on your DB2 catalog based on lobs coming into it, you probably have experienced some of that as well. What can go wrong, though? This is something that a lot of times people don't start considering with lobs when they start implementing them. Um, you can get errors when there are inconsistencies between the main components of a lob. Lobs are implemented with pointers. You know, the, the data doesn't get stored in the main table space. Well, unless it's fully in line. Uh, you can have a fully in line lob, but that's a small lob or a slob. And those things uh, are kind of a little bit different than uh, the traditional lob. So uh, you have DB2 indexes, and we know those things use pointers too, and they can be uh, inconsistent. But with lobs and the lob index, you can have these four areas uh, of inconsistency. The row ID and version number in the base table might not be found in the lob index. There can be entries in the lob index that aren't referenced in the row in the base table. You can have the lob data itself not be where the lob index points to and thinks it is, and there can be lobs in the lob table space that are not referenced by the lob index. So these are the type of things, you know, anyone who's ever used a system with pointers knows pointers can get inconsistent for any number of reasons. So what are the consequences when these things get inconsistent? Uh, if the lob index is not consistent with the base table, the data is lost. Because the lob index is the way you get to the data in the lob table space. If the lob index is inconsistent, then you'll get errors trying to access the lob data. And because lobs are big, remember the slide we had with all the different sizes, a lob in a lob table space can be distributed across multiple pages. And there are map pages that point to those data pages. So if all the data pages aren't referenced in these map pages, or if the map pages are not properly referenced at a higher level map page, map pages to map pages or pointers there, and then the final level of map pages out to the data, then log data can be lost. So we really need to be running multiple utilities in order to fix that. Check lob, check data and do it on a consistent basis. Real quick, storage is changing. Storage has changed, I should say. Even though we still talk about 3380s and 3390s, that's not what's being used to store your data. It's being stored on RAID devices. And these are disk arrays. And uh, the array has multiple physical disk storage units, a single logical device, could even be multiple logical devices. So the days in which we cared about where we placed our DB2 data are over. Uh, and if you are still doing it at, you know, you still map a 3390 logical thing to a RAID device, a, where that data is actually going, you're really not controlling it even though you think you are. Uh, what does uh, RAID stand for? Uh, it's Redundant Array of Independent Disks. I always think this is interesting because somewhere along the line, uh, it changed. It used to be redundant array of inexpensive disks, but then the vendors got their hands on it and didn't like that word. Uh, so it became independent instead of inexpensive. Uh, you can go back and look at some of the old uh, literature and that's really the truth. So the idea here is that multiple disks are put into an array and it's perceived as one disk. You get recoverability because those drives can be hot swapped out without bringing the device offline and the data just gets rebuilt onto them as, as you do that. There's many levels of RAID technology, I'm not going to go over all of that. Uh, the DS8000, 8800, uh, these are RAID 10 devices with these types of characteristics. If you're at all interested in that, I'll you know point you to the slides. I've also got another presentation all about DB2 storage. If you're interested in that, send me a an email, I'll be happy to share it with you. So what's happened here? The storage has changed, so DBAs have changed, or should have changed. 
Things that are historical worries, this extreme data set placement. VCAT defined data sets. Anyone still go out and define the vSAM cluster manually? Anyone? Anyone who's embarrassed to raise their hand because it's <laughs> uh, managing DB2 store groups. You know, in the old days, we used to uh, carefully associate volumes to store groups. So you know, when you created them, you'd say, you know, volume one, volume two, volume three, and then maybe another one, volume two, volume three, volume one, then volume three, volume one, volume two. So it would start and do it in that order. But, you know, the, those, uh, Links that used to be in the catalog that maintained that order are gone, so that doesn't matter. And on top of that, what you're really doing is being all messed up behind the scenes in the RAID anyway, so that doesn't matter. Separation of data sets. You know, the careful placement to avoid contention. I put all my indexes uh, over here. Maybe indexes here, indexes here, indexes here, table here, and that way I'm not getting head contention and volume contention. Well, we don't do that anymore. Maybe the one thing that we do do is uh, worry about the logs. We should. We should worry about the logs and put them on their own uh, uh, channel path. So this hypervigilant extent management is also something we don't care about anymore. Things have changed. Clone tables, briefly uh, talk about that. This is something where if you start looking into your system, you may see uh, data sets that look almost the same. Uh, because the clones are switching the data sets back and forth behind the scenes. I briefly uh, mentioned what a clone data set was earlier, so I'm not really going to go over this in any depth right now, other than to say, if you've got systems where you have to fully refresh the data on a regular basis, this is the technology to look into. And if you're still doing it an old way, you really should look into clones. They're very uh, nifty and efficient. IDAA, not going to spend a lot of time on this other than to say if you're doing a lot of analytics, doing a lot of uh, uh, business intelligence type queries, uh, IDAA uh, can be uh, implemented to really speed up your queries. And that means that a query that's run on DB2 on the mainframe doesn't run on the mainframe, it runs on this appliance box. And so you're offloading the work here. This is running uh, sometimes orders of magnitude quicker than what's happening here in DB2. That is great, but there's also all these other things you need to worry about DB2. You're not worrying about indexes because there aren't indexes on an IDAA box. It's a column store. And you are, though, worrying about latency. Hopefully, at some point, IBM solves that latency issue. But right now, if you've got uh, data that's in DB2 and you want to also have it on the IDAA, there is a latency between when it changes here to when it gets propagated out to the IDAA, just like any other uh, ETL or propagation movement. So that's something that complicates issues for DBAs. Makes performance nice for certain queries, but also it's not free. Well, actually, the box isn't free either. you got to pay for that. <laughs> uh, security, modernization of security. What we see is uh, SecAdam came out in DB210. So this is kind of an auditing and governance type of thing where we don't want our privileged users to have certain types of access. So split off the security control, have a sec atom that only deals with DB2 security, and the sys atom doesn't deal with that anymore. Okay? The, how many people here have implemented sec atom? Got one, got two. That's about common when I, I talk about this. Very few people have implemented it. If you have not implemented this, again, you're crippling yourself. There are certain features that only work with a sec atom. Uh, look at audit policies. Uh, if you're doing auditing and audit traces with DB2, the audit trace traditionally is going out and it is capturing the first select or insert, update, and delete in the unit of recovery. That, that's fine, but it's not enough if you're doing auditing. You know, say, so say I am a, a nefarious insider programmer who wants to uh, go in and change the salary I'm being played. And I have access to that data as a, a developer because I may need it for what other purposes. So I know how auditing works. Only the first modification gets trapped. 
So I go in, make an, an innocuous modification somewhere else, and the next modification is where employee ID equals my employee ID change salary to salary times 20%. And it doesn't get trapped. Well, with audit policies, it all gets trapped. But you can't use audit policies unless you have sec Adam because they're the ones that set up audit policies. So keep that in mind. Other types of uh, improvement, system DBA, uh, SQL Adam, access control data access, meaning if you uh, only want to allow uh, uh, them to control what's going on as opposed to access the data itself, you can split that out. Then you used to be able to split that out. Uh, we talked about the improved audit functionality. Column masks, row partitions, row, I'm sorry, row permission. These are new things that you can use to control at a more granular level who can see what. And earlier I touched on trusted context and roles. SQL itself is getting much, much more complex. You know, uh, let, let's look at a few examples. Common table expressions. Uh, many people have uh, changed the way in which they write uh, SQL with a common table expression. And you used to be able to write, you still can, write the select as the, in here for the from. But now you can move it out and reference it as a separate uh, object. And that's a little bit more efficient and effective. The other thing is it allows you to do recursive SQL. Here's an example of a setup where we got this hierarchy. Um, you like my employee names? <laughs> well, you got this hierarchy. Here's the table that sets up this hierarchy, and here's the data that we've loaded. We can come in here and write a recursive SQL where we've got this common table expression that's uh, called EXPL, and the common table expression references itself. So it's a recursive query. We come down here, we select from that common table expression that references itself, and it returns the information uh, exploding the hierarchy for us. It's an easier way of writing hierarchical SQL across these bill of material type of, uh, uh, of data. We've got OLAP functions. Uh, these are functions that the first time you look at them, they're not going to look like your standard SQL. Uh, rank, dent rank, row number. Uh, here's an example where we're ranking employees with total compensation greater than 30,000, but we're ordering the results by the last name. So we come down here, total compensation, add this all up as total compensation, rank it, order by salary plus bonus plus commission as rank compensation, but we're ordering by last name. So we've got this new function, an OLAP function with, you know, if we haven't read up on how an OLAP function works and we just take a look at our uh, developer code, that's going to confuse us. Moving sums and averages, not going to go over this in any depth. It's another example of more complicated SQL, but good because in the past, we couldn't do this type of stuff inside of SQL. We had to do it in the program, write it ourselves, could make errors. Putting it into DB2, into SQL, means it's going to be right. But it might be confusing to people who haven't looked into what it means. Temporal data. If we've started implemented temporal data, business time, system time, I'm not going to go over this. There have been other presentations here that talk about how this works. But what I do want to mention is what the impact of using some of these things does. I mean, we can uh, write these queries with, we have new uh, SQL here for business time from this period to this period. We can go in and update pieces of business time. This is an interesting one, I think. If we go in and update course for a portion of the business time that is in between, so say we've got a record that's out there, a row out in the database that's uh, 2011, uh, in October out through 2012 in March, and that's one row right now. And we're saying change this portion of the business time. Go in and make an update. The update has inserted rows. If we did a delete, the delete has inserted rows. So a delete causes the database to have more data than before the delete was run. That's not normal or expected. So there's lots of things we need to know about uh, temporal uh, data, not the least of which is what's happening to our data as we do this. Talked about dynamic SQL. Probably this is preaching to the choir. Everyone 
understands that most modern applications are using dynamic SQL, uh, the ones we develop as well as the packaged apps that we start implementing. The days of everything being static, long over. So with all of that in mind, it's a complicated world, and DB2 is changing. The other thing to keep in mind, I didn't mention any of this stuff, and this is all new too. So there's a lot to learn. Uh, can't cover it at all in an hour. So back to this, DB2 is still being asked to do more with larger amounts and more types of data, more rapidly being accessed without any downtime permitted, using new uh, database structures, and with fewer DBAs being devoted specifically to DB2 than ever before. So what can we do? Real quick. You can't manage DB2 the way you used to in the past. You need to treat DBA as a management discipline, proactive versus reactive. Been saying that for years, but that's more and more the case than ever before. Automate what you can. Use autonomics when and where they exist to free you up to learn more of the other stuff, to free you up to learn more of what's coming in DB2. Embrace modern tools and utilities that understand this new digital landscape. Pressure your vendors. Make sure that they give you the functionality that you really need them to give you. Make sure they cover lobs. Make sure they understand large uh, data can't be offline for large periods of time to undergo a reorg. And don't ignore training. If your, ven if your company's not going to pay for training, get it yourself. There's stuff online you can do. There's books you can buy. I know a couple that are good. <laughs> and uh, that's basically, uh, it's not your daddy's DB2. Uh, uh, question, when's the new book coming out? I haven't started it yet. It probably won't be until the next version. So I would expect that I can get IBM Press to allow me to do a version 12 book. What I'd request is if you're really interested in it, start sending them emails saying, when are we going to get an updated version of this book? It makes it easier for me to convince them to update it. Any other questions? I'll be here all week, so you can always hunt me down. Thanks. <laughs>